All right. Uh, welcome to Storage Capabilities in Cinder. I'm Sean McGinnis. I'm the current Cinder PTL. Uh, joining me are Jay Bryant and Zheng Yang, uh, some of the longtime cores of the project. Uh, just to make sure everyone knows why you're here or what we're going to be talking about, Cinder is the block storage service in an OpenStack cloud. Uh, it is a control plane abstraction uh, to be able to manage LVM, Ceph, uh, Lenovo, EM, Dell EMC, you know, whatever storage arrays you have in your environment, being able to pull those in and use those storage resources in your cloud. Uh, we currently support over 100 volume drivers as of the Okada release, uh, so it can, uh, it's pretty flexible to be able to use whatever your storage of choice. So the whole reason for this presentation is uh, there are some features within Cinder beyond just creating volumes and exposing them to guests. Um, we wanted to be able to just highlight a, a few of the extra features that are available uh, make sure some, make sure people are aware of those. So there are certainly more uh, beyond this, uh, but we picked a few things that thought might be interesting and uh, are going to highlight how those work and uh, hopefully show you it actually working. Um, we'll have <laughs> a we're recorded, so at least we'll have one good sender demo today. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we, so with that we weren't kind of, feeling as adventuresome as others. Uh, we went for recording it, which. That's a process in and of itself, but uh, hopefully you'll enjoy the, the output once we get there. So um, vol volume migration and retype was uh, one of the features I wanted to talk about because it's, uh, you know, it, especially as an administrator, it's something important to understand how it works and what it is within Cinder, um, but it's not always clear. So one of the things that uh, I've got a number of questions about while we've been here is, oh, migration, so that's that's moving with your VM, you know, if you do like a, a, a instance migration. No, this is just talking about the data migration and where that data is held at and, and stored from a volume perspective. You know, if you, when you do an instance migration, we handle, you know, disconnecting, reconnecting, but your storage in that case stays in the same location. Um, so vol volume migration, you can see from the, the graphic here, is uh, taking, taking that data that's running on one physical back end and moving it via Cinder, uh, you know, via the Cinder APIs, working with the host back ends um, to another location. So why would you do this? Um, well, okay, you know, the, the, diff the, the case where you have, you know, maybe you've brought a new storage back end into your environment and you want to, you know, rebalance data and move things so that you have, you know, certain storage in another location, that's a case where you do migration. Migration is different from retype, which is the other one I'm going to talk about here, and the fact that um, from a Cinder perspective, you have multiple volume types, um, you know, so that's how you label basically the, the class, how you classify where that volume is stored in your, um, your environment of backend storage. The simplest example, which I'll be showing later, is you know basically I've got one backend named you know LVM1 and one backend named LVM2. Um, they're two separate volume instances that you can you can migrate the data between because they report the same capabilities. Um, so I'll I'll show an example of that to kind of clarify it. But um, in the case that you are changing the type, that's where you do a retype. Um, you, you change how that volume is labeled as far as the, the capabilities that it requires on the backend storage behind it. Um, you, when you do a migration, your data is going to move from one location to another. When you do a retype, it may not necessarily move. So um, I'm hoping I, my demo that I do a little bit later will make that clearer. Um, but you then change the type that is associated with that particular volume and it's only going to work in the case that, um, that the type that you're switching it to satisfies uh, all of the needs in that capability. If not, it will actually perform a migration, and we'll show that later. So um, the two, two commands for, uh, that enable doing this uh, are cinder migrate and um, the, the 
couple of interesting points here to note um, are whether you, you lock the volume or not. Um, if, you, if you don't, I'm trying to remember, if you don't lock the volume, you can do migration on a volume that is currently attached. Uh, right? The lock is for uh, whether you can cancel it or not, you know, in the That's right. in middle of. That's right, whether you can cancel the move. Um, and then you indicate the volume that you're moving it to, or the name of the volume you want to move, and the target host that you want to migrate to. Um, in the case of the, the retype, uh, this is, you know, the migration policy option here is important because if you set never for migration policy and you retype to a type that is not satisfied by the back end that it is currently on, it will not retype. Um, but if you have on demand, it will take it and move it to back end storage that satisfies that type. Um, and of course, then you need the volume name and the target volume type. Uh, another fun feature that we added a couple releases ago um, is the ability to do generic image caching. Uh, so what we do here is, you know, we, we have a number of uh, larger installments that were having issues where they were trying to do boot from volume. And when you do boot from volume, you mount up the, the image from glance and you pull it through the control node over to the, or wherever the volume service is running, by default, the control node. And you pull it through the, that, and you do some QMU possibly on it, and, and write it into a volume. And if you're doing a lot of that, that's obviously quite, uh, you know, puts a load on your system. So this, this aims to reduce that by actually creating a, a uh, image volume cache so that you've got a cache of, of that image in your volume service that short circuits that path of having to mount it up from, from glance and having to write it through every time. Um, so the first time you do it, it downloads the image, caches it, and then subsequent boot from volumes will, will perform much better because you're not having to repeat that copy process from the uh, image store. Uh, to do that, um, there are some things that you need to set up in the cinder.com file. Um, you know, your, your tenant project ID and user ID, um, and then setting things like, you know, the, the maximum size that you want to use for your, your image cache. Um, you know, obviously you don't want it to just grow forever. Um, and the, the maximum number of images that you're going to allow in your environment. And obviously you have to enable it if you're going to use it. Um, other than that, that's, that's pretty much all you have to do to get this set up. Um, and then there are a couple examples here of the, the kind of commands you would use um, to do that first, uh, the first volume create where you're going to pull the image in and, and get, the, uh, get the cache primed for future use. Um, another way to do this is to just work with a volume backed image. Um, so you can set up the, in this case, you need to actually get Glance ready um, to be able to use Cinder as the back end for, for that image. And so you need to set up, you know, the, your authentication into Cinder here. And um, also, obviously, Cinder needs to know how to talk back to Glance. Um, so you need to set those options up there. But then you can use uh, the OpenStack client and do an image create um, and give it a volume and then it will create a volume um, that a, a volume for that image, and it will be backed uh, by volume storage instead of having to copy it each time that you do a boot from volume. So with that, we'll talk about replication with Shane. So replication API version 2.1 was introduced in Mitaka to solve one particular problem, that is, uh, if the storage backend is hit by a disaster, we provide a way for the admin to fill over the entire backend to prevent the loss of data. Admin needs to make a configuration changes in Cine.conf and to create volume type to support replication. In Cine.conf, there is a replication device option that needs to be configured. There could be multiple keys in the replication device option Backend ID is a required key. Uh, there could be one or more replication targets configured. Some drivers only support uh, one replication target, while others could support multiples. 
uh, in the volume type extra specs, you need to set replication enabled to is true. Also, drivers need to report replication enabled and a list of replication targets. We have three replication comments. They are fill over, freeze, and thaw. The fill over command is used to fill over all the replication enabled volumes to the replication target. Uh, all the volumes that were not replication enabled before the fill over will become unavailable after that. The freeze command is used to disable the sender volume backend. This is meant to protect all the existing resources so that no changes will be allowed uh, before you fix the setup and uh, uh, until you uh, run the thaw command. The thaw command is used to enable the volume backend again. So after filling over from backend A to backend B, if you want to promote backend B to be the new primary device and replicate into backend C, uh, some menu steps need to be performed. So first you need to freeze host, stop the volume service, go to cine.com and manually replace backend, B, uh, backend A with B and B with C that reconfigures the replication relationship. And after that, uh, you need to go to the database to manually change some database entries so that the backend is no longer in the field over state. After that, uh, you can start the volume service and throw the host. So this process is, of course, uh, manual and uh, error prone. Unfortunately, right now we do not have an automatic way to do it yet. There is a spec trying to make this more automatic, but it has not been implemented yet. Uh, also, we do not have a command uh, to do uh, fail back, but some drivers do support fail back by using fail over command and specify default as the destination backend. So after failing over to the replication target, admin can run fail over again, specifying default as the destination backend. And this is after you uh, fix your setup, of course, and that will bring the system up and running again as before. The generic volume groups feature was introduced in Newton to provide a way to manage a group of volumes together. One motivation for introducing this feature was that the existing consistency groups feature uh, can only be supported by a small number of drivers. This generic volume groups feature provides a default way um, that works for every driver. The default implementation simply loops around and create a group of volumes and a group of snapshots corresponding to the original volumes. Drivers supporting consistency groups can add that capability to generic volume groups. By using different group types, a driver can create a group that supports consistent group snapshot or a group that does not support it. This is similar to how volume type works. By using different volume types, you can create different volumes with different capabilities. The generic volume groups feature can also be easily extended to support other functionalities in the future, such as the replication group. We have comments to create a group type and set group specs in the group type. These are admin comments. This is similar to volume types and uh, extra specs. We also have comments to create, delete, update, share, and list groups. To create a group, you must uh, specify a group type and uh, all the volume types supported by the group. This is to make sure that the scheduler will pick a backend that can support the group type as well as all the volume types in the group. To delete a group that is not empty, uh, the delete volumes flag needs to be set. This will delete the group as well as all the volumes in the group. Also using a group update, we can add a existing volume to the group or a delete a volume from a group but do not delete the volume itself. We also have comments to create, delete, share, and list group snapshots. And we also have support for 
creating a group from a source group and create a group, create a group from a source group snapshot. In order to upgrade to Pike, operators need to run the data migration scripts to migrate data from the existing consistency groups tables to the generic volume groups tables. And uh, all drivers supporting CGs need to add this capability to generic volume groups in Pike. CG APIs still work in Pike, but they will be deprecated in Queens. To create a group that supports consistent group snapshot, you need to set consistent group snapshot enabled to is true in group type specs and volume type extra specs. If you don't set it, then a group will be created using the default implementation, which does not ensure consistency. Also, do not set the consistency group support key in group types or volume types, because now drivers report consistent group snapshot enabled in capabilities. So now, Sean will be talking about backup and restore. So we have backup and restore capabilities in Cinder, and this gives a way, obviously, of taking a volume and backing up that data to somewhere else. And then if something happened to your data, being able to restore that back to its original location. Um, this, uh, we, we do support full or incremental backup, so if you're doing this over time, uh, you don't need to copy the entire data out. You can do a one full backup, incremental through the week. Uh, you know, just the thing to keep in mind with any backup solution if you've ever worked with, if you just keep doing incremental, uh, when you need to restore that data, you need to start with that full backup and then work your way up. So it's not something you want to just do full once and then just keep incremental after that. Uh, there's non-disruptive backup. So if you have a volume attached to an instance and you're doing I.O., obviously we can't back up that data because I.O. is in flight, so we may uh, you know, copy off some data that ha doesn't have information that later on has information that was written out. Uh, so the way that works is it'll create a temporary snapshot of the volume, and then with that frozen point in time, we're able to take the data off of there. So we know it's in a, at least a crash consistent state if you have an, a running instance. We can also back up snapshots themselves. So one thing, uh, you know, non-integrated with Cinder, if you're, if you're backing up your data from a volume, you may, not, you, know, you may lose all of that snapshot information if you need to blow that away and restore the data. But we have a way to actually pull that out of there so that we can actually get back to that state. And um, we support several different backends uh, or, or destinations for these backups. Uh, uh, default, uh, I think, usually is Swift. Uh, you can do it out to an NFS share. A few releases ago, we had someone add a driver for Google Cloud. Um, so there's a lot of different options of where that goes. Now, I should say, uh, and it's not really called out in here, we're not trying to be a backup product. Uh, you know, we're, we're, this is not something that would replace uh, you know, some of the big vendors out there where their main focus is to do backup and recovery of data. Uh, we provide a mechanism through the Cinder APIs so that regardless of what type of storage you're using on the back end, you can get that data pulled off of there and written back. Uh, but we do not do things like uh, scheduling when these happen. There's no way through Cinder to say, I want this volume backed up you know, nightly at 2 a.m. So we provide the APIs, make it that nice storage API abstraction so that other applications, uh, you could write scripts that make calls into our API to pull, integrate this backup into some other uh, system process that you have. Uh, there's also other storage systems, uh, storage products that could write to the Cinder Backup API to be able to leverage our capabilities and then add their value on top of that. So we provide the mechanism to get the data off. We do not try to be a full service data protection product. So there's a few commands. Uh, you see there's a, a mix here. Uh, create a backup. Uh, OpenStack volume backup create. OpenStack volume backup restore. Pretty basic. Um, 
if you haven't heard the OpenStack client, why we have some command lines here that are OpenStack volume and then some that are Cinder, uh, is the, we're trying to standardize all of the OpenStack products around having a consistent API. That's the OpenStack client, that's the OpenStack volume, OpenStack server, OpenStack whatever. Uh, we don't have every functionality of the, open, of the Cinder client moved over. Uh, so there's a couple of commands on the bottom that are less commonly used, maybe. Uh, the Cinder backup export, where you can take a backup that's been done, export the metadata about that so that you know out on the <coughs> Swift object store, here's all the data about a backup for volume, and then you could later import that. So we're gonna walk through a few demos here. Hopefully some of this makes a little more sense when you can actually see it in action. We'll start off with showing the volume migration in retype. Yeah, so um, hopefully this, this goes smoothly. Um, so this is gonna demo the migration and retype process. And what I did here to demo this, it's kind of a funny setup, but you know, it's a simple example to give you an idea of how it works out. Um, you know, we had a controller with two different LVM driver backends, um, and then um, I had a separate NFS host that I w had access to to provide a third backend. Um, the reason I have the three is I wanted to show the, the way that you could retype um, from LVM driver one. So I had two, re two types that were just named based on the backend name, LVM driver one and LVM driver two. And then I had a type that was for iSCSI protocol, which is satisfied by both of those backends. Um, obviously, then the NFS one was named NFS one, and it's not going to report an iSCSI um, capability because it's an NFS is the protocol for it. So uh, what the demo will do is I will create a volume that's uh, of type LVM driver one. Then I will retype it to be iSCSI and you'll see the type change, but it's not gonna move because the storage it's currently in um, satisfies that, that need. Then uh, at that point, I'll do a migrate, which I can, can do here. I'm gonna move it from the first backend to the second backend, which works because the iSCSI type is compatible with both LVM driver one and LVM driver two. They both report that same capability. So it lets me move it. Um, and then finally, it's like, well, I, I wanna get it off of my LVM space, so I'm gonna move it over to NFS. Um, and so at that point, I do a retype and set it to, um, you know, the migration policy is true, so that it will actually move over into the, the uh, NFS space. Um, go along with what Sean mentioned a little bit earlier. I use Cinder client in this case, uh, so the Cinder commands to do this because OpenStack client has migration commands, but it doesn't yet have the retype commands. So uh, just for consistency and to make things less confusing in the demo, I just use Cinder client for all of this. We're working on getting parity. Uh, we'll get there. Just now, click on it. Click on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, everybody cross their fingers. Ta-da! <laughs> all right. So, um, uh, all of these require to be admin user, uh, so that's why I wanted to show actually sourcing that there. <laughs> Starting with a clean slate. Uh, don't worry, you don't have to watch me type all of the commands. Um, this shows here we've got our backends. We've got a NFS backend and the 2LVM driver, like I mentioned. These are running in VMs on my laptop, real exciting. There are types, the, the four that I mentioned. and I'm gonna show you the extra specs that go with those. So we've got three that use the volume backend name and then there's our storage protocol one that just says, hey, I'm gonna go out and look for that type. So I'm creating my volume now. Look for that capability, I should say, when I'm using that type. So I created my volume in LVM driver one. You can see there, showing you the details about it. And I also, I can go and show you that it's currently in the LVM driver one space uh, running under dev stack. That was what that LVS was. I just did my retype and moved it to iSCSI and 
Now, if I show you the details again, you can see that it hasn't physically moved. The type has changed, but it's still on the LVM driver one. So I'm going to now migrate it. And it says, hey, I can do that for you. And we give it a little time here. Um, as the data, you can see it's in the migrating status. And that is the last uh, action that it completed. We can see now it's in the LVM2 LVS, when you do the LVS. And now we can see that that has also changed from a host perspective. And we have successfully migrated. So next, we're going to retype it over to NFS with on-demand migration. Do a list. And we can see there's a brief period of time where you see it in both locations, where one is available and one is deleting uh, or retyping or then deleting as it goes through the process. It's no longer an LVM. I jump over to my NFS server. I must type LS. There is my volume. And there's my ID. And if I jump back, do a cinder list, there's the same ID. It's available. Name's the same. And we're now an NFS1 volume type. Ta-da. <laughs> so that's how you move your data all around. Round and round it goes. Where we stopped was on NFS. So we'll probably go back to LVM eventually. But. All right. Next. Generic volume groups, follow that up. Uh, so I'm going to do a demo on generic volume groups. My demo setup has two cinder volume backends. One is connected to a Unity, and the other one is connected to a VNX. Uh, the VNX driver supports consistent group snapshot, so I'm going to create a group on VNX that supports consistent group snapshot. The Unity driver does not support it yet, so I'm going to create a a group on uh, Unity using the default implementation. Just click. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. So first, create group types for Unity and uh, VNX. Now set consistent group snapshot enabled in the VNX group type. Let's see. Next, create volume types for Unity and VNX. Set consistent group snapshot enabled in the VNX volume type. Create group on Unity. Let's create a new volume in the unit group. <laughs> Add an existing volume to the unit group. If the volume is not in the group at first, use a group update to add it to the group. Now it's added successfully to the group. Now create a group on VNX that supports consistent group snapshot. Create a new volume in the VNX group. Add an existing volume to the VNX group. The volume is not in the group. Now use group update to add it to the group. Now it's added successfully. Mm -hmm. 
now create a group snapshot on Unity. Now delete the group snapshot. Create a consistent group snapshot on VNX. Create a group from a consistent group snapshot on VNX. Now create a group from a source group on Unity. Finally, delete the group and its volumes. We need to set a delete volumes flag in to delete a group that is not empty. Okay, so that's the demo for generic volume groups. All right, aren't aren't these console demos exciting? <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, for the next scenario, showing backup recovery, um, I, I wanted to something a little more realistic. So I have an instance in, in my Nova compute of a DB server, database running there, uh, that has a volume from Cinder mounted as slash data. So the database is running. It's got data written to this volume and under slash data. And I'm going to back that up to my Swift object store. Uh, to kind of make this uh, easy to see the multiple pieces, uh, just to explain what I've got here, uh, the top panel is going to be my connection to the database server, so I can show you that, that actual data that's running there. Uh, center part here, I'm going to just run some command lines uh, so you can see that happen. Uh, I've got my uh, server named DB server, and I've got uh, volume attached to that uh, called dbvol, as you can see, is attached to db server. And then on the bottom here, I'm just going to tail the cinder backup log just so you can uh, see some of the activity that's going on in the back uh, behind the scenes. So on the database server, we'll just take a look at uh, the database. Uh, we have a table there called inventory. Um, don't have any data right now, so I will just add some data to the inventory. Truck comes in, unload it, add the inventory to stock, <laughs> and now we can see got a bunch of data, really important critical data there. Uh, so I want to back that up. I will run the OpenStack volume backup command. I've already done a backup, a full backup once, so I am going to do um, uh, incremental. I'm also giving that force flag. I had mentioned we can create a backup of a volume that's attached to a running instance. That needs that dash dash force uh, to tell us, okay, yeah, it's attached. Create a snapshot backup from there. And you can see here that kicks off some stuff on the back end, and eventually we'll see create backup finished. So. I've got a backup. I'm a new DBA. I go out there. I'm messing around in the database, <laughs> trying to figure out, huh, how's, how's this Mongo command line work? Uh, you know, what, uh, I saw this on, the, on an example on the web somewhere. What if I do uh -huh. delete many? And, uh, huh, wait. <laughs> OK, my inventory is <laughs> gone. What do I do? Oh, no. Quit. <laughs> Get out. So uh, I'm just going to power off that machine because Things are bad. <laughs> <laughs> so go back over to my command line, open stack volume backup restore. Uh, D, you just tell it the DB backup. That was the name I gave my backup and DB volume. But wait, it's available. That means it needs to be available. Uh, our volume, even though I've shut down that instance, is still attached to the DB server. Uh, on the Cinder side, we don't know if any I.O. is going to come down. We can't restore data onto a volume where possibly I.O. could come and corrupt that data. So I'm just going to shut down. My, my instance, remove that volume from the server while it's shut down. Now I can do that restore. That's going to copy the data back. And then through the magic of video editing and hand waving, that data gets back uh, pretty quick here. And restore backup <laughs> finished. Your time might take a little bit longer. 
So now, you know, okay, I saved the company. <laughs> I need, I can go back. I need to reattach that volume back to my instance. Uh, just tell it DB server, DB vol, and I'm giving it a device, make sure it shows up in the same place that I'm expecting it, and I can start that instance back up and running. Uh, that's really the only tricky part, is that you, you need to detach the, the volume all in order to do this. So now that I've started up my database server again, can go back over to the command line. We'll take a look, reconnect to DB server, go in there once it boots up. And uh, now I can go back in, connect to the database, and take a look at my inventory table. And wait for it. Ta da! Yay. My inventory is back. So, woohoo! Saved it. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so, for all of these, uh, you know, there's a lot of other features in Cinder, uh, but if you're interested in any more information on, on these, I have a few links here uh, the migration docs. Um, you'll notice there is a mix here. A lot of this is in the admin guide. Unfortunately, some of this is actually in, uh, you'll notice debref in our API, in the URL here. Uh, so there's, that's usually our developer reference, but right now we're kind of sorting out where some of the documentation is and how that gets generated and how it gets published. Uh, so some of this we have better using user information in our developer reference. Um, so you'll see a couple of links there will point you to that, uh, but then we do have uh, hopefully most of this in the admin guide, so you can go there, find out more about these, and find out more about other functionality. So, that, uh, I think we have a few minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions, if you could come up to the microphones, that would really help. Um, we'll try to answer whatever we can in the next couple of minutes. <laughs> yes? I got two questions. All right. uh, the migration and retype, can that be done while they're attached? No. It's, if you don't need to migrate, uh, you can retype, I believe, I don't think we blocked that. Well, right, if, if, if you're retyping without migration, yeah. that's fine. Because mm -hmm. the typical use case of the retype without the migration is just you want to change a setting on the volume, and you know, for most settings, you can yep. do that. Uh, you know, for some backends, that might be changing uh, caching policies or things like that. So it's something that it can be done on the fly. Yeah. If you need to actually move that data, then you're looking at more like a Nova Live Migrate type of thing where we can't really, um, okay. we yeah. can't do that from Cinder. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, second question, I have one of those uh, backup managers you're talking about, and right. I need, I make use of the Cinder backup, which fantastic, mm. thank you by Great. the way. Good. Um, the backup import and export records, mm. I have a need to Unmanage uh, the abandon, adopt, abandon. I need. I, mm. There's no way now to uh, remove control of that imported backup from Cinder, except for deleting the backup. But I don't want to delete the actual data; just get it out of the database. Is okay. that coming? Uh, I haven't heard the use case yet, but I can totally see it now that you point it out. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to be able to back up the data and have that information out there and export it out of Cinder and have Cinder forget about it, but you still want your data out there so you can re-import and pull it back if you need it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is probably something we should look at doing, and that is a gap that we have right now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good yeah, question. Thanks, thanks for the feedback. We'd, things like that, any kind of feedback of something you need, let us know. Yeah, yeah. thank you. For, I have a, got a question concerning the backup. So what you get if you back it up and you have a file system on top, what you get is a crash consistent snapshot, is that right? So you rely on the file system and the journal may need to be replayed. There's nothing like a freeze guest yeah. FS agent or whatever there was in order to actually tell the file system, okay, now you need to flush everything. So for right. instance, if you have like, okay. Yeah, there, there's no. This, you have X3, but if you have something that's not journaled, you may end up with something that. Yeah, there, there's no guest integration in this backup. So the only way that you can get to, to guarantee that you have a totally consistent backup is actually shutting down that instance. If you do the backup by taking a temporary snapshot, that is just, you know, you, there could be an application that has IO in flight. So when we take that snapshot, there is a, a small chance 
well, depending on your application, hopefully a small chance that there will be something there and they'll have to replay some data. Yep. I believe, are we 40 minutes? <laughs> yeah, I think we're. Yeah, okay, any other? <laughs> yep. migrate, mm -hmm. so uh, when you create a cinder volume, like you just did, it actually activates the truncate command. Mm -hmm. So even though it's like a 10 gig, it's only on disk, is like 10 meg or something like that. So right. the question is, using cinder migrate to migrate to another volume backend, uh, what will be the actual size on the backend? Will it be like one meg or 10 gig? I believe it'll be 10 gig. So, yeah. Um, because the, the issue is, um, most thin provision volumes, there's no data. You try, if you try to read anything that hasn't been written, you get zeros back. Yeah. Uh, the problem is if you're migrating that out somewhere else, some storage types actually need those zeros written out. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, so depending on your, your back in storage, I know some, some arrays are smart enough if they see a bunch of writes of zero in their thin provision, they'll just throw that away, kind of make it a no-op, but I believe um, you need to write the full size. That I believe we've got to write out that full size. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Any other questions? All right. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank uh, you. And again, any other feedback, let us know. All right. Thank you.